In Ford's recent earnings call, Jim Farley, the CEO, said they would unveil a new family of EVs, affordable EVs. This should come to the public spotlight in their Kentucky Louisville Assembly Plant, or LAP, in the next week or so, August 11th. We should have Walter from our team, by the way, on site to catch any breaking news and share it with you guys as soon as possible. There seems to be a lot of hype built around this, especially internally at Ford. It's been called a Model T moment. And while I have some thoughts, some, some hopes and dreams uh, of what this could mean, or what Ford will need it to mean in order to succeed in becoming a major player, perhaps the major player, on affordable EVs. And if you have thoughts as you hear my thoughts, well, leave them in the comments below. Let's get into it. So what led to this? Well. Jim Farley has been spending some time with Chinese EVs and perhaps was impressed or scared. He spent a really good amount of time with the Xiaomi SU7. We've seen him talk about Chinese EVs in general, their technology, just how impressed he thought they were and how he didn't exactly say we're doomed here in the US compared to that, but he didn't really seem that optimistic about the US EV space after experiencing China's, which is great. China is making huge technological advancements, and yes, they have a lot of backing from the government, and it's like not quite an apples to apples situation, but still, more and more EVs should be looking at China. But Jim and the Ford team that have been testing Chinese stuff have undoubtedly seen the LFP batteries and even the cheaper cost and are probably wondering how can we get to that level. I mean, I don't know if we'll get to that level. There's a caveat with the cost thing. You might see cheesy attention-grabbing headlines that are somewhat misleading about, you know, $15,000 EV. Well, you see it's, it's heavily subsidized by the government, both on the production side, but also the purchasing side. And you also can't really equate it to the US market because while well, we can't get these EVs here, there'd be a huge tariff, which would like double the price, and then you're back to square one. Well, actually, even double the price, some of these cars are pretty compelling. We simply don't know what the price would be here, but bottom line is that they would be cheaper. So Jim was really impressed by China. He actually threw together a Skunk Works team, which basically just means a team in a company that works to develop something really groundbreaking, uh, like secrecy is paramount to its success. And this is not a new concept. Uh, Lockheed Martin famously has a Skunk Works team, which is how we got the likes of the SR-71 Blackbird, F-117 Nighthawk, U-2 Spy Plane, some cool stuff. So every time I hear the word Skunk Works, I'm kind of like stoked. So Ford made a Skunk Works team to develop a cheaper EV platform. Up till now, Ford has had their Lightning F-150, the Mustang Mach-E, the Ford E-Transit, and over in Europe, there's some actual partnership stuff with Volkswagen, which resulted in the Explorer, the Capri, the Puma E, which those have actually been featured on this channel by our European colleague in Norway, William. And while Ford's first gen EVs are good, I actually have a lot of great things to say about them, a lot of friends who are owners who love them, but also I wouldn't say anything was super groundbreaking. And with the recent quarter results in with a loss of about $1.3 billion, maybe it's time to do something groundbreaking. So this team, notably Alan Clark, which was a employee at Tesla that helped develop the Model Y seems to be involved pretty heavily. Also with uh, developing and resourcing LFP battery solutions. But there's also a lot of heavy hitting talent from the likes of Lucid, Rivian, Apple, and more. Probably people you want on a team like this. You see, when I'm reviewing cars from certain manufacturers, I'm always surprised at some of the engineers that I meet who have never driven the competition. I don't know how you can build a super competitive product without actually driving the competition. Uh, but it sounds like Skunk Works here at Ford is trying everything, including Chinese stuff. So this Louisville assembly plant, or lap, like I said, has been prepping itself for EV production, which includes building chargers, which, I mean, that's not, that should be a given, but building chargers and canopies and more dock space and also tooling itself for EV production. It's all part of a $1.2 billion investment. This is where the event should take place on August 11th when they unveil this new Model T plan, and this might actually be where they assemble whatever cars they are unveiling. 
which would make perfect sense as to why it's being held there. Notably, the current things built at this plant are the Ford Escape and the Lincoln Corsair. And so I'm curious to see if this new platform kind of resembles the platform the Escape is built on, which is I think C2 or something like that, um, which underpins the Escape, the Bronco Sport, the Maverick. Building multiple vehicles on a platform is what makes sense. So this new platform may have some shared underpinnings or uh, inspiration from the Escape and Maverick and Bronco Sport and we might finally even see a Lincoln EV. I always forget Lincoln exists, except for the fact that they have really cool names. Nautilus, Navigator. So this brings me to the next point, which is what does this need to be? Well, like I said, cheaper is the bottom line, which could lead to smaller and a bit more range. Notably, the Lightning, the Maki, -E, the E-Transit, none of those are small. And I've always been an advocate for telling people they don't need as much range as they think they do. I'll get into my ideal specs in a minute, but I mean, 200 miles would be fine. Even though I feel like as an industry, we've kind of settled on this 300 mile expectation, but that's also associated with all the existing price tags, which while well, the average new price of a new car is 50 grand, average EV is a bit more than that. But we also know this will be a mid-size pickup truck, which is Ford speak for Ranger kind of. Now I actually was hoping to see more of a Maverick size. That truck's been doing really well, I think partially because people don't necessarily always want a full-size truck like the Lightning or the F-150 in general, and the Maverick is magically efficient. We tested the Maverick and achieved like 47 miles to the gallon in the hybrid variant, which is so impressive. A lot of people want sort of trucks to do some light trucky things, but don't really want the caveats or the side effects of poor fuel economy or a giant monstrosity to drive around town. And those are the exact problems Tello is trying to achieve. But with their price tag being a bit higher, I think the importance of this undercutting all the competition is, well, important. So maybe this will be Ranger size or Maverick size or somewhere in between. They're also going to look at building other vehicles on the platform, including retail and commercial space. And they're also claiming to feature personalized or customized digital experiences. Ah, I hope that's not like gimmicks galore. Sometimes the Chinese stuff has too much digital things and they need to like stop and tone it back. Strip it down a little. Wait, not that much. I think what they need to have is a rock solid app with phone key functionality and good software with route planning. You know, your typical EV things that we've come to kind of expect today, except I don't think Ford's is really class leading in any way. They have an app, a good app, and it's actually been improving, but it's not the best app. They have route planning. It kind of is mediocre. They have decent software, but even modern cars are a little bit more laggy than I would like, although they've made good improvements in that regard to their credit. So technology in that human interface capacity, they need that. Also, they need good charging. I'm talking 200 kilowatts with a good curve. I feel like if this was coming out like right now, I would accept 150 kilowatts. I mean, we're talking cheap car, so like where can we cut things down? But I really do think by that point in 2027, which we'll talk about dates in a bit, but surely by 2027, we can get to China's 2023 numbers. <laughs> especially after all the time they spent with China. So a small battery with 200 kilowatt charging and a good curve would mean fast charging times. Boom, solid. They also need decent range. I don't think they need big range. I think most people are totally fine with like 150 miles. Let's call it 200 to play it safe. 200 kilowatts, 200 miles, rolls right off the tongue. But I think most people would be totally fine with 200 miles. That accomplishes technically even road tripping. I've done road trips in cars with 200 or actually far less miles of range because it's all about the charging and we have more and more charging infrastructure finally fully widely available. So you can pretty easily charge your hop. 15 minutes of charging, boom, 200 miles. This is what our 10% challenge is set up to test. But maybe they'll even have a smaller, even cheaper battery. Like maybe they'll have multiple battery sizes. I don't think that would hurt to experiment with. And as long as the smaller battery has like close to 150 miles of range, still appeases most people. And being LFP batteries means you can theoretically use the entire capacity. The whole thing of like, I paid for the whole battery, I'm gonna use it. Uh, you know, with NMC batteries that we've seen in all of their other products thus far, you're typically not supposed to charge it above 80% on a daily basis. Heck, it's happiest sitting around 50% uh, long-term storage, maybe 30 to 50%. There's a lot of data out on what's more healthy for NMC chemistry batteries, 
But for LFP, in general, you should be able to use, you know, charge to 100 almost consistently because that helps keep the battery happy. So that's like my essential wish list. But if this is a platform shared situation where they also incorporate hybrid or plug-in hybrid technologies, that's where I am cautiously optimistic. We've seen some challenges with cars who have been developing things on one platform, trying to be fully electric, fully ice, and somewhere in between. It's kind of like a multi-tool where no single tool is that amazing. But then again, doing a platform sharing that broadly is what keeps costs down, and that's what's bottom line here, most important. So I really hope that even if they do this platform of ice HEV, PHEV, electric. I just hope it doesn't compromise any one of those pillars too much. But again, whatever it takes to get the cost down for both Ford and the consumer, that's how this succeeds. So let's circle back on that Model T moment that seems to be every headline. Calling it that makes this event have huge shoes to fill. So you see the Ford Model T was iconic. The original Model T came out over 100 years ago, 1908 actually, for $850. That doesn't sound like much, but inflation is obviously a tremendous thing. So in today's money, that's close to, but under $30,000. That's pretty impressive. But the Model T eventually, through magical production quality improvements, uh, efficiency, things Ford helped pioneer with the assembly line, they were able to bring the price down all the way to its lowest point of, I think, $260 in 1925, which equals like $5,000, less than $5,000 in today's money. That's insane. And that's not going to happen. But the point is that they could indeed improve or even overhaul the processes from the point of developing the car, but also engineering it, manufacturing it. There's so many places and ways that they can I don't want to say cut corners per se, but streamline and improve the process. I mean, that's how Ford kind of originally made a name for themselves is really inventing a proper assembly line. Use cheaper materials that are still good. Use cheaper battery packs like LFP that are still good. Refine and refine and refine the assembly process and maybe even limit the amount of customization. I mean, Ford famously had early cars like the Model T uh, that came in any color you wanted, as long as it was black. So to make it a Model T moment, I'm guessing it means, well, all those assembly improvements, but also making it cheaper. Bring back the people's car. I mean, Volkswagen kind of tried to do that with the Beetle, but the original people's car, which was like the Model T. But the Model T was basically affordable transportation, which was groundbreaking at the time because cars were considered largely a luxury item. Have you seen Downton Abbey? It was bringing a groundbreaking technology called a car to the middle and even lower middle classes. You see, when the Model T came out in 1908, well, cars had already been around for coming on a couple decades, but that's kind of where we're at now. EVs have been around for coming on a couple decades, at least in a mass market standpoint. So maybe it is time for a Model T moment. So streamlined efficiency in the production process, but also a lower price tag, those are Model T moment things. But even if they can do that, they're not quite doing this Model T moment in its entirety. The Model T had almost countless impacts on improving and creating more in the gasoline industry, the auto repair shop industry, the tire industry, and new jobs and economic opportunities that are so massive and hard to gauge. It allowed more transportation for people to live further from their place of work or to do leisure activities like vacation in a car. It also brought standardization and interchangeability to the parts. It's almost like thinking of the right to repair process, which would be really cool if these also incorporated that somewhat. Streamlining parts, making it easier to fix, repair, replace, upgrade. I don't know if it'll go fully the slate thinking of like, buy a blank slate and do stuff with it, but I'm just so curious. So all that to say, the Model T truly changed history. And you can bet that Ford's marketing department will basically say whatever's coming out soon will also change history. But on that, I think the jury's still out. I'll believe it when I see it, and I hope to see it. So when will this happen? Well, as I said, uh, the unveiling of something, which might end up just being like a first tease glimpse with some vague backgrounding information, 
Either way, we'll bring it to you guys as soon as we find out. But whatever is unveiled may come out in about 2027. That seems to be word on the street. And I think we should note the landscape will shift by then. It's kind of interesting how this happens. Um, you know, Tesla and, and other companies have unveiled cars that are coming out in like two, even three years. Rivian, for example, with the R2 and the R3, when those were unveiled, it was like such mind blowing price and tech and everything. But when those start coming out and, you know, not just like rolling out a couple first ones at a time, but like become massively available, the landscape does shift. So whatever Ford's about to unveil and talk about, we have to take into account that it's coming in a couple of years and that's just the start. So who knows what the landscape will be by then? They may say this is the first EV under $30,000, but we still have the new Chevy Bolt that GM recently teased, which I'm hoping is under $30,000. We also have Slate, which will probably come eventually, but I don't know. There's a lot of skepticism around Slate, and that may also undercut the price tag, though probably not as cheap as they wanted. You see, Slate wanted to be 20 grand. Now they're looking at probably 27.5 because the tax credit situation. And then Tesla has a stripped down Model Y. I don't know what they'll call it, but an even cheaper car that they're also hoping will undercut the $30,000 price tag. Now, I don't know if this will be kind of like the $35,000 Model 3 that was technically available for a limited amount of time just to meet the promise that Elon made, but was so hard to even get that no one really got it. So we just don't really have $35,000 Model 3s. But hey, if this thing is close to the competition pricing, but has things like powered windows and infotainment screens and things that Slate seems to be missing, it'll be interesting to see how Slate can compete. I love Slate. It looks sick. But with Ford's truck strategy, it seems that four doors and four or five seats seem to be a priority, especially if this is mid-size. Slate will probably undercut this in terms of size. It seems to be smaller with maybe a bigger bed. So, hey, the more the merrier. Bring on competition. Either way, I hope this comes out on time, either meeting or exceeding expectations. Ford does seem to play things somewhat conservatively, just like a lot of the other uh, Detroit Giants. Wait, is that the football team? This may surprise you, but I, I don't want sports. But I hope all of these cheaper cars come out at a magically affordable price. I hope people start to realize you don't need crazy level EV to have a successful tool for your daily use. So many people don't even realize they could live with like 100, 120 miles of range a day. And with a lot of people charging at home, does the DC fast charging peak speed even matter? Well, I think if this is meant to be a car that people could have as their only car, it really needs to be able to do everything. So we'll see something unveiled or strongly teased on August 11th, and we'll bring coverage to you guys as soon as humanly possible. Let us know in the comments what you think. Should we take bets? Do you have any predictions? I am all ears. I'll see you down there. I'll see you in the next one.